This is MPB News. Hi, this is Ashley Norwood. Thanks for checking out the At Issue podcast. If you like what you hear, please like, rate, or leave a comment. Subscribe to this and other MPB News productions like Mississippi Edition to stay up to date. Don't forget to tell your friends about us, too. You can also watch At Issue on MPB TV Friday nights at 730 or on mpbonline.org. Thanks for listening. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. That issue tonight, a Senate bill that some believe is attacking poor people on government assistance, is making its way through the legislature. The Senate bill would authorize the state auditor to check a sampling of tax returns to verify the income of people enrolled in Medicaid, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF, and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. The bill's opponents say it could discourage those in need from applying for assistance. They also call it a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. We are watching as you are attacking our public benefits. You are watching as we are, you are attacking families and communities who are most in need. We are also watching as you are making decisions. And those same decision makers are making sure that their friends and their allies are making money off the backs of those folks who are most in need. And we are not going to stand idly by while these things continue to happen. Over 27 percent of the children in the state of Mississippi live in poverty. 14 percent of white children live in poverty. This is not a race issue. All we have poverty in this state that crosses all spectrums. So when you start making it difficult for somebody to get health care, which is who, what you're making it difficult for, a person receiving health care gets no cash benefit. If there's fraud and abuse in the Medicaid program, it is at the provider level. It is not at the level of the person needing the help. The only thing a person gets from Medicaid or CHIP is an opportunity to go to the doctor. So where is the theft there? Why are we making it more difficult for these people to apply? The bill passed the Republican-controlled Senate last month, but the House made some changes in committee before passing it onto the floor on Wednesday. Amid objections from several Democratic lawmakers, the Republican-controlled House voted 75 to 46 to pass Senate Bill 2257, largely along party lines. Republican Representative Joey Hood is chairman of the Medicaid Committee. He says for every $1 Mississippians pay in taxes, the state receives $3 for Medicaid. That amounts to $4.5 billion. Hood says federal authorities are pushing states to set an income verification process to ensure that only qualified people are receiving assistance. This is what we're going to have to do from the compliance. There's a 2019 compliance statement that said we should be auditing. The state's required, the auditor's office is required to submit something to the federal government. Of course, we receive a three-to-one match, and what this does is protects the integrity of the system. It's not going to affect the aged, disabled, or blind. It's just going to be an income-based thing, and it's going to be just another tool in the toolbox to check eligibility. That way we can ensure that the funds that for Mississippi's most poor will be where they're supposed to be and go to them. Representative Robert Johnson is a Democrat from Natchez. He says the state division of Medicaid told him they don't accept tax returns as proof of an applicant's income. He says they use paycheck stubs instead. Johnson also says the bill has been presented as a federal or requirement, but it is not. The auditor and some of the people uh, fostering this legislation have said there's a federal mandate that says we have to audit the recipients of Medicaid. It's, that's not what it is. There is a federal supplement that talks about things that the auditor can do to help the program run more efficiently. And it, it, it speaks to it in a way that says, if, if you deem it necessary, or if you think it needs to be done. And they, they reason that because we get so much money in matching funds, that that's something that we need to, that the auditor has to do it. Well, it's interesting that it comes on the heels of these arrests on people stealing millions of dollars of tenant funds. And we feel like, and I feel like it's, it's a result of political pressure to say, oh, you're going after, you're going after Republicans. Uh, now you need to go after people who are receiving benefits. The bill is being held for the possibility of more House debate before it heads back to the Senate. Both chambers must agree on a single version before the bill can be sent to Republican Governor Tate Reeves. 
The Senate Education Committee passed a different version of a bill that gives scholarship money to families with children who have special needs. The Education Scholarship Account Program was created to provide families with about $6,500 to help pay for tuition or special services at private schools or other institutions. According to the State Department of Education, about 700 students currently receive scholarship money through the program, which ends this year. In 2018, a state oversight committee found the program needs more accountability. Commonly referred to as the voucher bill, Republican Senator Dennis DeBar tells MPB's Desiree Frazier that this new Senate bill has more accountability. This is not the bill that was passed in 2015. Um, we put a lot more accountability in it. Uh, not only on the schools that are the ESA school, but on ensuring the child is receiving the, the, stu the services they need, that child needs. Um, we want accountability. We want to make sure we're using our taxpayer money wisely and ultimately the child is getting the services they need at that school. So if a school uh, holds itself out as providing SPED services. What was that services? SPED, special needs, special education. Uh, then they need to be providing that service to that child. They can't not just take the money, the ESA scholarship money, and ask the public schools to come in there and provide the, the services for that child. They need to provide that services, and they, and they need to certify that uh, to the Department of Education. I also heard in there that if that does occur, then they have to reimburse public schools. Is that correct? Well, what that happens is say a, a child um, is enrolled in a school uh, for a week or a month, then leaves that school, says, well, it's not working. Um, the parent removes that child from that special purpose school, puts that child back in the public school. That money follows the child. And the money shouldn't just stay with that ESA school, the private school. It's going to follow that child back to the public school because the public school then is going to be responsible under the law to educate that child. So they should receive the money. Part of the Education Scholarship Program's new accountability structure is to test children using voucher funds at the beginning and end of the school year. The results will be submitted to the State Department of Education to measure the level of progress in the program. Pete Smith is with the Education Department. He says records will also be made public. Well, I think the changes are definitely a step in the right direction. You know, the Department of Education was at the table when the bill was first being drafted some five years ago. And uh, we have no issue with children being able to go to a, a different school to get the services that they need. Our main issue was making sure that there was accountability put in the bill so that we are, so the taxpayers are ensured that the students that are leaving public schools, going to these other schools or other, getting other services, are making sure that their IEPs are being met and they're progressing academically, which is, I think, is the whole intent of the bill. So uh, I think with this new rewrite, um, the Department of Education, uh, uh, you know, is, is very uh, uh, in, in support of this new accountability piece in the bill. Lawmakers say revisions to the bill will also stop funds from going directly to parents unless proper documentation is provided and only schools accredited by the Mississippi Department of Education can accept voucher money. Now the measure goes to the Senate Appropriations Committee for further review. Gun safety advocates are asking Mississippi legislators to pass a bill that would allow family or law enforcement to intervene when they believe someone who has access to firearms is a threat to themselves or others. It's commonly known as a red flag bill. Mary Helen Abel is with a group called Mississippi Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. She explains Senate Bill 2055. It basically says that with adequate due process, guns can be temporarily removed from the hands of someone who it shows to be a risk to themselves or to others. Um, so that's something that we know has made huge differences um, in, in gun deaths across the country in the states where it has been enacted. About 17 states have that, have a bill, have a, have a law that's a, an extreme risk protection order law. Abel says an emergency chancery court hearing would be held to determine if a risk exists. If so, accessible firearms would be confiscated for six months with the possibility of renewal. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, close to 600 people die by guns in Mississippi each year. That's the fourth highest rate of gun deaths per year in the United States. Tanjula Shelby of Jackson says she is lobbying lawmakers after her 25-year-old son 
was shot to death in 2017. Please, please develop, establish, talk about and pass laws that are against gun violence. We're in, Moms and Men Action, we do not oppose individuals having guns, but what we do is we want you to make sure that there are laws that um, enforce gun sense use. Meaning, if you have someone that's, prime example, my son's killer, a felon. If he is caught with that gun, there's zero tolerance for that. Um, point B, um, if you are if you have mental issues, mental problems, you should not be in possession of a gun if you know you have been evaluated by a psychiatrist and it's be, you know you have cognitive reasons why you should not have a gun. As well as if you know domestic violence cases where individuals have been de you know deemed threatening. So we just want them to pass laws. We want to show our face and say, hey, look, this is important to us. And it should be important to everyone, whether you're directly or indirectly affected by this. This is not just me, the mother who's lost her child. This should be you, the citizen who's living within the community, and say, oh, my goodness, this could happen to my child, my son, my mother, you know, my husband, whomever it may be. You know, you don't want to walk into your local grocery store and someone stand in line with you with a gun and say, uh, is this a bad day for him? Because, you know, people have a tendency to get upset over little things. And had, if they have that gun on hand, what decision would they make with that? The CDC also says 48% of gun deaths in Mississippi are suicides and 46% are homicides. Republican Representative Randy Rushing says he will consider gun safety legislation. At the same time, he tells MPB's Desiree Frazier he's concerned about potential misuse of a red flag law. I would encourage anyone who has a concern of someone harming themselves or other people to call 911 and we don't need a law right now to do that. Anyone that, that feels threatened or feels like someone else is a threat to themselves or other people can pick up the phone now and call 911. I think we're, we're getting into a gray area when you can have a dispute with your neighbor over a fence line or my dog's barking, keeping them awake at night, then my neighbor can pick up the phone and say they're scared of me because I own a gun. It creates a you know, an opportunity or an avenue, I think, for a lot of vindictive uh, measures to be taken. So we have to be real careful uh, when we are looking at laws for that type of thing to take place. So uh, I think the intent maybe uh, have some validity to it, but, but I'd be very, very hesitant before I got off into that direction. Even though it would be on a temporary basis? Well, you know, as the old saying goes, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary law. So uh, I'd be very, very hesitant on, on supporting something like that unless we really, really looked at it and got in down into the nitty gritty of it. Advocates for the legalization of medical marijuana in Mississippi are working to educate voters who will see a measure to that effect on the November ballot. Citizens will decide if they want medical marijuana made available to people suffering with conditions like cancer, chronic pain, epilepsy, or seizures. Dr. Rachel Knox of Oregon is a cannabis specialist. She and 75 other health care providers and organizations are promoting the referendum called Medical Marijuana 2020. We're living in a world where one in two adults is sick with something and the burden of chronic prescription drug use is beginning to weigh on people. Uh, I think folks are fed up. Uh, patients are very commonly have laundry lists of prescription drugs that come with unwanted side effects. I think there's a movement right now in the patient population to move away from synthetic drugs, drugs into more natural lifestyle and that includes the tools at their disposal that they use as medicine, right? We're, we, we are seeing people convert to natural medicine in droves. The referendum would require medical doctors to prove that a person is suffering from a debilitating medical condition. The State Department of Health would provide identification cards for patients and regulate treatment centers where products would be dispensed. Republican Representative Trey Lamar tells at issue producer Ashley Norwood that he's concerned with the referendum's current language. You'll see there's a bill that's been filed to offer some alternative, alternative language, and um, I expect uh, I expect a spirited debate on that as well in the next week. I guess what concerns you most about what you see now written in the standards if we were to pass something like that? Sure. Uh, well, I guess just the number one concern would be the thought of placing uh, the right to marijuana in our Constitution. Totally different than having uh, just a regular state law. 
Uh, there's no other drugs that I'm aware of that have a place in our Constitution. Um, alcohol does not have a place in our Constitution. Uh, I just believe that's a, a bad precedent to set. But on top of that, uh, some other uh, serious concerns I have is that the current language removes the appropriation authority as well as the taxing authority from the legislative branch of government and hands it to an executive branch agency. That's dangerous. Democratic Representative Omeria Scott, a breast cancer survivor, has authored several bills to make medical marijuana legal in this state. She says she supports the current referendum and believes any legislator offering alternative language is part of a scheme to confuse voters in November. The initiative has been driven by the people. So my question to them is, do you question the people's judgment when they vote and send you up here? To me, we're questioning the people's judgment uh, who have gone through all of these rigors to get this initiative done. Now, what the initiative will allow is for the citizens of the state to speak. So why don't we let them speak to the issue that, has, uh, that they have brought through the initiative and referendum process? Because had we wanted to do something about it, we've had every opportunity. I had a bill last year that they didn't vote on. So. Clearly, this is the same kind of scheme, in my opinion, that sunk Initiative 42. And I'm hoping that the people will be able to see beyond this and certainly support the original initiative that is going to be on the ballot in November. Let's get straight to the point now with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is an attorney and former Democratic member of the House. Austin Barber is a national Republican strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Good to have you both with us once again on Thanks. that issue. Let's start with the uh, TANF bill. Uh, Brandon, this reminds me in some ways of the opposition we got to voter ID in Mississippi, where uh, the perception is you're putting a barrier between the people and the thing, and also you're attacking a problem that doesn't exist. Do you see some parallels there? Yeah, I think uh, the analogy of a solution in search of a problem works here. Um, we heard uh, a lot of references to a federal mandate. It appears that that's not actually the case, that it was urged, but not something that's required. But what's more stunning, I think, than anything else about this program is this comes just days after the head of a department in the Mississippi government was arrested, along with many of these top-line employees, uh, for stealing TANF dollars. And then rather than do anything that would make that outcome less likely, they go after recipients. And so I think it's a wrong-headed proposal that attacks, frankly, our most vulnerable citizens. And let's add this data on top of it. Mississippi has one of the highest rejection rates for those individuals and families who apply for these services. So now we're adding another hurdle to it. It's almost as if the state is saying, we're doing everything in our power to make sure that these funds don't reach the folks who need them the most. And, and I should say this, um, I'm a policy director for the Southern Poverty Law Center. We care deeply about this issue. I joined in that press conference the other day. It looks like the bill's gonna pass. There are several other bills in this area. I'm hopeful that maybe those won't make it quite this far. Yeah, that makes my stomach hurt that, that you said that because I cannot believe and I don't want to believe that there are people that, that are in my party or that are in your party or that are independents that would say we don't want these TANF dollars, federal dollars, to get to those that really need it because that's the purpose of this. And I thought Joey Hood said it really well, who was the chairman of that committee, and I was not in that committee meeting. and. I'm not as up to speed on this issue as you are, but I'm sort of looking at this from a common sense approach where Joey said, this money is for really poor people, okay? And our goal is to make sure that we've got as much of this money as we possibly can have that gets to the people that need it. And I'm pissed off about what happened at DHS. And there are a lot of people that are. And when that case goes to court, and you know, gets fully vetted, we will see what happened. And those that were involved, if they're guilty, I hope they've served the maximum penalty there because that's gross and it's obnoxious and we should, I mean, and it's beyond selfish. And obviously it's greedy. There are a lot of poor people in Mississippi who need this help. And whether you or someone who is applying for these dollars or you're running a program that's using these dollars to help people, 
I think you should be fully vetted to make sure that the dollars are going where they're supposed to go. And I certainly hope that there's no one who really thinks, let's just, let's just keep as much of this money as we can and not get it to the people that need it. Because as a Republican, I do truly believe in safety net programs for those who truly believe it. Sorry to get on my horse there a second, but I, most of that was pretty good, Austin. Well, thank you. Go, That's a, what a shock. You said you would give me credit for anything. <laughs> Let's move on to another topic then. Now, uh, red flag, red flag laws, uh, Austin. Any any uh, legislation in Mississippi typically that uh, that has anything to do with gun control meets stiff opposition. Uh, do red flag laws uh, would they likely meet the same fate here? Yeah, I think it's DOA. I mean, I. I um, I can't remember if it was Lieutenant Governor or Speaker. Somebody in leadership said this bill is basically DOA. Look, this is another issue that, that really matters, particularly with the news that we have. I'm like, I don't want to use this term constantly, but it's a lot of these mass shootings or individual shootings or whatever it is when someone's murdered. Um, and, and, and sadly, these are people that have mental health issues that, that, do get, that do have access to guns. I don't know what the best process is for that. I do have concerns, um, just like the chairman of the committee, Chairman Rushing said, I do have concerns to make sure that, that we don't get into a situation to where people's rights, and we do have the Second Amendment as part of the U.S. Constitution that allows me to have the right to, to own a gun. I, I, do, I am concerned about that. There is this balance, though. We do have to make sure that, you know, w we are... Um, we, we are focused on those with, with mental health issues and making sure that their access to guns is as limited as possibly can. So it, it's a tough issue. It ain't going to happen in one legislative session. It's something that we should seriously look at, no different than tax reform or, or Medicaid reform, those kinds of issues to figure out what's the best way to attack it. You know, Austin, I feel like this proposal is more narrowly tailored than some we've heard in the past and uh -huh. probably is on a trajectory towards a better outcome than maybe things we've seen before. You know, guys, there's no secret here. The gun lobby is a multi-billion dollar industry and lobby. And they have infected every aspect of our politics at the national, state, and local level such that regulating anything in this industry is like the third rail of American politics. And so it's a very difficult political space to wade into. But, you know, when you think about it, we already regulate whether or not you can drive a car if you're proven to be unsafe on the roadway. Nobody makes the arguments we heard Representative Rushing make. We regulate all variety of access to medications, all variety of access to a whole host of things. The gun lobby is so powerful that just merely mentioning, removing those from folks who are designated and adjudicated as not right for a gun ownership, you hear what happens. So I hope that, that they're able to find some foothold and, and tailor this thing to a way that works because as you hear it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, I, and obviously you feel the same way that I do. I feel terrible for the mother who lost her son who, who was interviewed. I mean, I feel awful. And I, I have no idea whether if this law would have been in place, if that would have saved the life of her son or not. Um, but obviously very compassionate for her and, and others that were up there who may have lost loved ones. But this is an issue we, that, that needs a, a lot of discussion. Let's move on to these vouchers for special needs children. Uh, Brandon, do you think that the program needs to be extended at all? And if so, does it need to have more oversight? Does it need to have more restrictions on who can receive these uh, and how they use these dollars? Yeah, yeah you know, the, our watchdogs at the federal government who look at these programs uh, said that ours was one of the least accountable in all 50 states. Um, our own peer committee here in Mississippi said you probably should discontinue it. It's, it's not responsible. Um, and then numerous other folks, whether it be University of Arkansas or studies out of Louisiana, have, have made the same points. Um, so no, I, I don't think it should be extended. Look, we're not fully funding our public schools. If you're not doing that, taking a voucher that diverts public money to a private school, is it's just not the right time for that. You need to fully fund your public schools first. But I will give uh, Chairman DeBar some credit. He has put in some true accountability, like this notion of if you're going to take the money, you need to provide the service. 
he talked about the issue that they're running into. There were schools that were taking this money and then paying the public schools to come and provide the service. That doesn't make any sense. And so that was happening with such regularity, they had to put that in. And now you hear proponents of the voucher saying, well, that might kill the program. Well, look, if that kills the program, it wasn't a good program to begin with. So I think he's done a good job of trying to get this thing as accountable as possible. I'm working on this one as well. It's another issue that I care about. Um, you know, I, I still think you can't amend this thing back into good shape. It probably needs to be discontinued. Yeah, we just disagree. And I mean, look, I, I, we're never going to agree on on the, the 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 I guess the funding mechanisms for public schools. I believe there needs to be more competition. We both believe there needs to be you know as much accountability for every state dollar, particularly in education. But I know if I had a special needs kid, and and I'm very fortunate that 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 I don't. Um, and, but there are a lot of parents who are not as lucky as I am. Um, and, and particularly if I lived in some rural area or some urban area, and I didn't feel like that the public school that I, that I you know, uh, sent my kids to because I couldn't afford uh, an independent school, parochial school, private school, I, I, know, I would know I want another option for them. Don't trap my kid just because of the zip code that I live in. To, I live in. But I think it's great that Dennis DeBar uh, is fighting to make sure we have the right program with as much accountability as we possibly can. We shouldn't go shelve this just because the first three or four years there were some issues with it. It's a good program. It makes a lot of sense. Let's just continue to make it stronger and better. Another amendment they didn't mention, uh, uh, Chairman DeBar's vice chair is, is David Blunt, and he amended it down from a 10-year repealer to a four-year. So that gives the legislature an opportunity to look at this program again sure. in shorter order, which I think I think that amendment passed unanimously. I think so. I think there's agreement at a minimum to keep this under a we, watchful eye. We need eye. to look at our education programs as much as we possibly can. What are the policy decisions that we're making to make sure it's the best for the kids in the public schools? I got no problem with four years. Yeah. We got it every year. Right. All right. Brandon, Austin, thank you both, and thank you for joining us. We're out of time. Don't forget, you can watch this program online at mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast now available at su.mpbonline.org. For day-to-day -day coverage, follow MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thanks for listening to the At Issue podcast from MPB News. If you haven't already, subscribe to get new episodes weekly. And don't forget to like, rate, and leave a review. You can also stay in touch with MPB News on Twitter and Facebook. For daily news, check out the Mississippi Edition podcast. Thanks for listening.